Genesis chapter number 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Let's pray. Father, you have been good to us. You have blessed us far beyond our deserving. And Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, on this very cold Sunday morning. Lord, this good crowd showed up to worship you. Lord, you're worthy to worship when the sun's shining or when the wind's blowing. You're worthy of our worship and our praise. For Lord, you have fearfully and wonderfully made us. And you made us to bring glory to your name. Lord, we're without excuse not to do that because you are a great God. The psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And Lord, we'd have to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, for you are good to us, and we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing. We thank you for the good choir singing and congregational singing. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you, Father, for the good testimony. Again, God, thank you for your goodness. Now, Lord, thank you we have the Word of God. Lord, we don't have to base our, our beliefs on what somebody says or somebody thinks or some ideology or some religion. Lord, we can base how we worship you upon the truth of the Word of God. You said that the day would come when they would worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, that day has come. And God, we're blessed with the copy of the Word of God. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Help us this day to receive it with gladness. Help us to hide the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Now, Father, I don't know the needs of anybody really here today, but, Lord, you know the need of every heart. Lord, you know our downsitting, our uprising. You know the number of the hairs on our head. You know the thoughts and intents of our heart. Lord, you know our yesterdays, our todays, our tomorrows. Uh, God, you know it all because you're God. Uh, and Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help people around here. Uh, I pray for that one that may be low in spirit. God, you'd help them and strengthen them and lift their spirit. God, there may be somebody here today that's uh, facing great opposition. God, I pray you'd give them the victory. There may be somebody here today who's just struggling. Uh, they're just struggling to stay afloat. God, I pray you'd help them to keep treading water. And God, give them uh, uh, what they need today. Uh, Father, there may be somebody here today on the mountain. I pray you'd just help them to keep shouting the victory. And Lord, there may be somebody here today that doesn't know you in the free pardon of sins. Uh, Lord, they don't even know they're lost. Uh, God, I pray that today you'd reveal their lost condition, but also reveal that there's a Savior who'll save them from their sin. Uh, Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel. I pray you'd bless every heart. And I pray that Jesus would be greatly magnified. Lord, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Uh, thank you for being so good to us again. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, I want you to notice a few things from these verses. Uh, I want you, and you got to pray for me. It's hard to preach looking down at Miss Melissa's boots. I don't know where in the world she got those things. Uh, she, she's been in Michael Jackson's closet or something. I don't know where those things come from, but Lord have mercy. The reflection, I'm getting 70s crystal balls coming into my mind right here. Huh? So pray for me. 
But I do want you to notice some things from the text. The first thing I want you to notice is the serpent. Look again in verse number 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Uh, we find that there's a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Can I say that uh, God made the Garden of Eden? It was a perfect environment. Uh, there was no sickness. There was no sorrow. There was no suffering. Uh, there was nothing to hurt. Uh, everything in the garden was perfect. Uh, it was paradise on earth. Uh, uh, can I say that God uh, uh, formed man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. Uh, and man named all the creatures and all the vegetation in the garden. Uh, and uh, man was not satisfied. Uh, and the Lord uh, uh, did a supernatural operation, took one of his ribs and made him a woman. And you have Adam and Eve uh, living in this perfect environment. Uh, uh, listen, uh, this is an environment that you and I don't know anything about. Uh, there is no sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there is no curse of sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there are no thorns and thistles in the ground or on the rose bushes. Uh, can I say the lion would lay down with the lamb? Uh, there was no uh, enmity between uh, uh, the animal kingdom. Uh, everything was harmonious and everything was wonderful uh, and the best part about it uh, is God would come down and walk with man in the garden uh, Adam could see God naturally uh, and Adam could see all the spiritual world uh, Adam had access to things you and I have no idea what it's about uh, but we find one day in the garden there comes a serpent can I say some things about the serpent? He's referred to many names in the scriptures. Can I say he's called Satan in Job chapter 1 and verse 6 uh, and in Luke chapter 10 verse 18. He's called the devil in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1. He's called Abaddon and Apollyon in Revelation 9 11. Uh, he's called Beelzebub uh, in Matthew 12 and 24. Uh, he's called Belial uh, in 2 Corinthians 6 15. Uh, he's called our adversary in 1 Peter 5 and 8. Uh, he's called the accuser of the brethren uh, in Revelation 12 10. Uh, and he's called the dragon throughout the book of Revelation, but you find it in Revelation uh, 12 and 9. Uh, can I say something about the serpent? Uh, 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 he is uh, vile. Uh, he is something uh, uh, that is against you and I. Uh, hey, in eternity past, uh, he was Lucifer. Uh, he was the archangel, the anointed cherub. He was the minister of music uh, in heaven in eternity past. Uh, but he got filled with pride uh, and he thought to overthrow the Lord uh, and take up his abode on the throne of God. Uh, and God cast him out of heaven. Uh, and we find that this sorry, no good serpent shows up. Uh, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, can I say some things about him? Uh, uh, we find in verse number one, he's subtle. He doesn't show up in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. He wants you to think that's what he is, uh, but he's very subtle, very sly, very crafty. Uh, matter of fact, before you figure out who he is, he's already got you. He's very subtle. Can I say uh, he's a seducer? He seduces people and deceives them. Can I say he subverts, he corrupts things. Uh, 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 he never wants to leave something in the state he finds it. He always wants to leave it worse. Can I say something? He steals. The Bible says the thief cometh not, but for to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh, he wants to rob you of every blessing, uh, every joy, uh, every thought of God. Uh, he wants to rob you, my dear friends. Uh, he's a stealer. Can I say this? Uh, he slinters. Uh, 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 that's a word that means lies. He's a liar and the father of it. Uh, he won't tell you the truth. Uh, at best, he'll tell you partial truths. Uh, uh, can I say that he sets snares? Uh, he wants to entrap everybody that he can. Uh, and he strives against all things holy. That's who he is. Uh, can I say uh, he wants to do some things? He didn't show up in this garden just to show up, he had an agenda. 
Can I say, uh, he wants to stupefy you. He wants to mislead you and blind you to truth. You know what's wrong with this world? Satan has blinded the minds of them unless the glorious light of the gospel should shine unto them. Can I say, people are just blinded. You say, look what this knucklehead did. Look what that one's doing. Look what that... They're just blinded to truth. If they really knew they was going to have to give an answer to Almighty God in not too many years, uh, they'd live different. Amen. But they don't know that because they've been stupefied. Their minds have been blinded. Uh, can I say, he wants to split you. The devil is a divider. The Holy Spirit is a uniter. The devil wants to divide. He wants to divide this church, wants to split this church. Hmm? You know why we have so many aisles? To confuse him. Most churches just got one. He wants to split them. Huh? He wants to divide people. He wants people against one another. Amen. How beautiful and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. He wants to divide your home. He wants husband and wives fighting all the time. Uh, wants children and parents fighting all the time. Uh, he's happy when you're miserable. Amen. He wants to split you. Can I say this? He desires to sift you. The Lord told Peter, Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat. He wants to shake the very core of your, by, about your being and your beliefs. Amen. He wants to sift you to where you don't even know where you stand on things. Huh? Can I say he wants to strip you of all you own? He wants to take it all. Hmm? He thinks he owns it all, but we know the Father owns it all. Uh, can I say he wants to shatter you? He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your faith and destroy your very body. And then can I say he wants to sent sentence you and damn you to hell? The beauty about being saved is I'm not going to hell. But he'll still accuse us before God. Tell God that we're not worthy to go to heaven. But I'm glad my salvation is not content on me. I'm glad I'm in Jesus' hand and Jesus' hand's in the Father's hand. I'm glad I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. I'm glad I've been forgiven of all sin, past sin, present sin, and future sin. I'm glad I'm robed in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, and when Satan accuses me before the Father, uh, I've got an advocate seated, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, the Lord Jesus himself, who stands up and says, No, Father, he's one of ours. Uh, he's engraved in the palm of my hand. Uh, and the Father says, I'm justified as if I'd never been a sinner because of what Jesus has done for me. We see in verse number 1, the serpent make no mistake he's not just hanging around back there in Genesis 3 1 he's hanging around all over and he's got imps all over and he wants to destroy people's lives we see the serpent but I want you to notice the sin look in verse number 6 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. They disobeyed God. You see in chapter number 2 in verse 17 the Lord told Adam in verse eight, uh, 15 to dress and keep the garden and in verse 16 he told him he may eat of every tree of the garden but in verse 17 he said but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die and Adam and Eve did die that day spiritually because they disobeyed God you see, the devil in his subtlety just twisted the word of God a little bit. And Eve believed the devil more than she believed God. When she got to looking, see, that's what the devil does. He gets you looking in the wrong direction. He gets you listening to the wrong things. And the next thing you know, you'll be doing things you never dreamed you would have done. They disobeyed God and they sinned. My dear friends, 
because they sin. Sin was brought into this world and sin was passed upon every man. Death came into this world because of their sin. When they sinned, everything that was perfect and wonderful changed. All disease came into this world. All ill came into this world. All suffering, all heartache, death, all sorrow, all came into this world because they sinned. You realize before they sinned, they didn't have to deal with mosquitoes? You know, I was thinking this morning, what's so good about the cold? Maybe to kill off mosquitoes. We won't have a bad mosquito population this year. Huh? They didn't deal with mosquitoes till they sinned. Hmm. Uh, the Bible says because of their sin, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us was conceived in iniquity and in sin did our mother bring us forth. We were born sinners. Hmm? The Bible says in Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Can I say all sin and come short of the glory of God? The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God made a remedy for our sin, and his name is Jesus. Hmm? We see the serpent. We see sin. But notice self-righteousness in verse number 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We see the first attempt of man seeking his own righteousness to be just in the eyes of God. Man sins. When he sins, his eyes are opened, uh, and now he realizes uh, he's a sinner. He sees that they're naked, they're undone. And so his remedy is not to repent and ask God to forgive him. Let's have our own righteousness. Let's sew together some fig leaves and make aprons to cover our nakedness. Can I say, ever since that day, man's been trying to cover his nakedness before God. We'll do it in the cloak of religion. Well, if I give so much money, or if I get baptized, or if I join a church, or if I go through this religious experience or that religious experience, uh, I'll be all right before God. Uh, friend, it's all faded leaves uh, uh, that will not cover our nakedness. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness our uh, righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away the bible makes it clear the very best that we can ever be is just filthy rags in the eyes of god that's why my salvation can't be contingent on me the Bible says in Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Hmm. There's a lot of people look around and say, Well, that's a good man. Maybe in our eyes, but not before God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's why we've got to be saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus and robed in His righteousness. If not, our righteousness won't stand before God. We see the serpent. We see the sin. We see their self-righteousness that carries on. But notice their shame in verse number 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. If their fig leaf righteousness was so good, how come they ran and hid themselves?
our righteousness won't help us. And in the presence of God, we know that. We see their shame. They're ashamed before God. There's some that are ashamed to even face the preacher. How in the world are they going to face God? We see their shame. Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 25. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. When we're not right with God, we, we are ashamed. God help us to get right with God. But then I want you to notice the sacrifice. Look at verse 21. And there's a whole lot I've skipped through in this chapter because I just want to get to the message. But verse 21, the Bible says this, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. You see, those fig leaves was not going to endure. They needed to be covered by something else, and in that verse we find blood is shed for the first time. The Lord killed some animals. There's a blood sacrifice so he can cover their nakedness. And can I say that was just a picture that one day God would send his perfect lamb who would uh, bleed and die for our sins uh, that we might be covered uh, by our nakedness before God. Uh, our sins would be forgiven, we'd be cleansed, uh, and we'd be covered uh, by the Lord Jesus' righteousness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We find the sacrifice had to be offered in order to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. And can I say, Jesus became our sacrifice to cover us and to cleanse us from all sin. I'm interested in verse number 9 this morning. Verse number 9 says, And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? Can I say, what a good God, what a gracious God, what a long-suffering God, what a forgiving God, what a redeeming God, uh, what a Savior. Uh, God did not have to go down to the garden, but he went down to the garden. When he cried, Adam, where art thou? God knew exactly where he was. Uh, God knew exactly what he had done. Uh, but yet God, in his long suffering, uh, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, uh, had made a plan uh, uh, for fallen man. Uh, and God, uh, in his mercy, uh, goes to where man is because man could no longer come to where God is. Uh, hey, uh, Adam could no longer uh, uh, have the relationship Relationship he once had with God, uh, yet God goes to where Adam is, uh, and God calls out to Adam, uh, What a blessed day! Uh, third Saturday night in March uh, 1974 uh, when God came to where I was uh, and God spoke to my heart uh, hey, and that day when I called on the Lord uh, he saved me uh, changed me uh, hey, made me a child of the king uh, adopted me in the family of God uh, and changed my eternity uh, when he forgave all my sin uh, you've got to understand They say that in a lifetime, the average person uses 10% of their brain capability. Only 10%. Some don't use that much. But they say men like Albert Einstein and some of the geniuses use up to 17, maybe 18% of their brain capacity. Before the fall, Adam had all his. 100%. How did he name everything that was named? He had a mind like God. Uh, how could he see 
the spiritual world and the physical world. He had a mind like God. How could Eve talk to a serpent? She had a mind like God. They had abilities that we can't even fathom. But when they chose to sin, all that went away. That's how they knew they was naked. And can I say, man's been getting dumber ever since. You don't believe me? Go to the mall on Friday night. Uh, but here we find in the midst of their depravity, a thrice holy God goes to where they are and God calls out to Adam. You may be here today and God might be calling out to you. Yeah. Might be speaking to you about something in your life he's not pleased with. Might be speaking to you that you need to be born again. Might be speaking to you like he, he was speaking to uh, uh, Brother Daniel that he needed to surrender his life for service unto God. I don't know. All I know is God speaks. But notice what God said. He says, where art thou? And that's what I want to preach on. Got three simple points. We'll go to house. Where art thou? thou now don't look to the right of you the left of you in front of you behind you look within where are you that's what the question God has asked for the ages where art thou can I say first of all where art thou in your standing before God let me ask you a question are you redeemed the Bible says in Lamentations 3.58, O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul, thou hast redeemed my life. Can you go back to a place where God saved you and changed your life? Where the blood of Jesus was applied to you? Now listen, when I got saved, I didn't know nothing about the blood of Jesus being applied to my life. All I knew, I, I was lost and I needed to be saved. And I believed on the Lord and called on him and he saved me. I found out all that other stuff after I got saved. And I'm still finding out stuff in being saved. All I can say, it's been a wonderful near 50 years. Uh, about a month and a half, it'll be 50 years. What a blessing. Huh? Can I say, can you stand with all assurance and say, I know I'm redeemed. Hmm? Where art thou in your standing? Are you redeemed? Let me ask you this. You say, preacher, I know I'm redeemed. Where are you in your standing? Are you right with God? He's coming soon. Lord, have mercy. About time I think it can't get any worse, Biden does something else. Of course, he still thinks he's a senator, but he done something else. Are you right with God? Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You're not going to have to give an account for God for me. You ought to thank God for that. But you are going to give an account for God, to God for you. You're going to give an account to God how you've lived your life since you've been saved. You're going to give an account to God for the Scriptures because that's what we're going to be judged by. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You're going to give an account to God for the deeds done in your body after you save. You're going to give an account to God for what you've done with what He's blessed you with. You're going to give an account to God. Let me ask you again. Where art thou in your standing? Are you right with God? I wouldn't leave here today not being right with God. Let me ask you this. Where art thou in your standing? Are you rooted in the things of God? Mm. The Bible talks about in the last days people will be carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know why? Because they're not grounded. They're not rooted in the things of God. I didn't ask you if you are rooted in your beliefs. I ask you if you're rooted in the things of God. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets 
prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. <clears throat> How's your standing? Are you rooted in the things of God? Where art thou? Where art thou in your standing? Where art thou in your steadfastness? I'm so sick and tired of wishy-washy people. In this world, you can't, you can't say anything because it'll offend people. Uh, they're trying to do away with statues, and they're trying to do away with Archie Bunker, and they're trying to do away with Looney Tunes, because all that offends people. Well, go be offended is all I care. But can I say it's, it's happened to Christians. You can't preach this Bible anymore without offending people. Well, preacher, you can't say that in church. You can't call people sinners. The Bible calls them sinners. I'm calling them sinners. Uh, well, you can't preach on that sin anymore. Huh? They'll... they'll Cause you to go woke. You go woke, you go broke. I ain't going woke. Huh? You can't call homosexuality a sin. No, I won't. I'll call sodomy a sin. Mm -mm. Preacher, you can't, you, can't, you can't preach against lying and murdering and fornicating. And not, yeah, you can because the Bible does. Amen. But we've gotten so soft and so wishy-washy. Because we... I have had people tell me, just preach on Jesus and just preach on love. So what would you do? I did what Phil did. I laughed at him. I said, I preach on Jesus every time I preach. And I love preaching on heaven and the love of God and all those things. But you know what? You've got to preach the whole council of the Word of God. Uh, if all you want to do is be lovey-dovey, you're going to be a wishy-washy. Uh, but how are you in your steadfastness? Hmm? Can the Lord count on you? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. It didn't say if it's convenient. It didn't say if it's cold outside. It didn't say if it, you know. It said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Folks ought to be able to count on you. God ought to be able to count on you. Hmm? Where art thou in your steadfastness? Are you faithful? Are you fruitful? It's ordained of God that we bring forth much fruit. And are you on fire? We ought to be on fire for God coming. I want to go out in a blaze of glory. I don't want to go limping out of this thing. Uh, in Western talk, I want to go out guns blazing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, taking every shot at the devil we can. Where art thou in your standing? Where art thou in your steadfastness? This is the last point we'll be done. Where art thou in your service? Does the Lord have to come down and holler for you, try and find you? Do you ever work with somebody that no matter what, they're never where they're supposed to be, never doing their job, and somebody's got to go find them all the time? Uh, there's no place for that in the Christian work. We all got to pull our load because we're all fitly framed together. But let me ask you something. Where art thou in your works? Now listen, I'm not saved by works. But because I'm saved, I do want to work for the Lord. You know, I say it all the time, a hundred years from now, the only thing that's going to matter is what we do for Jesus. What are you doing for Jesus? Amen. Only you can answer that. But you ought to be doing something. I mean, as good as he's been to us, we ought to do something. I was telling a preacher the other day, I'm busier now at 60 than I was 40, and I don't know how, I gotta, how I'm going to get everything done. i got to get done, but I'm going to try. I like being busier at 60 than 40. We all want to be busier for the Lord than we used to be. Hmm? Where art thou in your works? How about this? Where art thou in your willingness? 
God may never call you to do something, but you ought to be willing to do anything. Hmm? You ought to be willing. Brother Stewart just passed away. When Brother Stewart came to this church, he had pastored Carthage Baptist Church for 43 years up in Cincinnati. I was 38 years old. He pastored longer than I'd been alive, and now I'm going to be his pastor. I had numerous preachers tell me, oh, you don't want an old preacher in your church. He'll, he'll try to run things and take over. Brother Stewart never once even hinted at usurping my authority. But I will say this, any time I ever said we need to, his hand was the first one to go up. I make a motion. I'll never forget when we incorporated with, sta with the state, I said, we're going to need some trustees. I'll do it, preacher. We're going we're to need uh, uh, to start the building fund. I make a motion. He was always the first one to put up his hand and was always willing to help me do anything. That's the way we ought to all be. Hmm? Can I say he was one of the best church members you'd ever have? You know why? Because he'd pastored for 43 years. He knew what church members acted like. He wasn't going to act like that. He was going to be willing. We ought to all be willing. Huh? How's your service? How you doing? Where art thou in your works? Where art thou in your willingness? And where art thou in your witness? Folks need to know about Jesus, and the only way they're going to know about Jesus is the people that know Jesus tell them about Jesus. They're certainly not going to find out about him on TV. You know, used to, you could turn in, and there would be some good TV preaching. Man, I can't find any now. If you find some, let me know. I know some watch podcasts. You've got to be careful with that. Sometimes you tune in some of them recovering fundamentals. Those guys, those guys are crazy. Huh? But I remember, used to, you could hear some good preaching on TV. I remember when T.D. Jakes would shuck the corn on TV until he started making a lot of money. Uh, I don't want to be used to been or has been. I want to be current for Christ. But how's our witness? The Lord said, where art thou? Today, he's saying the same thing. Where art thou? You're here today and you don't know the Lord. Today's a perfect day to get to know him. So, preacher, how do you get to know the Lord? How, can you, how do you get born again? How do you get redeemed? Well, in a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come. You come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible, show you how to be. It's very simple. Even a child can understand it. The most important thing that you need to know is you need to know that you're not saved, not born again, not redeemed. And when you know that you're not that, you can get born again. You can get redeemed. It's real simple. Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you today. He said he'd no wise cast you out. If you're here today and you're saved, is your life counting for Jesus? Look what he did for you and I. Where are we at? I mean, isn't it high time God's people stood up, <coughs> drew a line in the sand, said, notice as far as we're going, we're going to make a stand for the Lord. And come what may, we're just going to be faithful. Hmm? Where are you at? I never want the Lord to have to ask, Doug, where art thou? Say this, I'll be done. The night of what we call the Last Supper, Jesus once again lets his disciples know that he's going to be betrayed in the hands of angry men. He's going to be crucified. Only this time he says, and one of you going to betray me. Well, they all got tore up at that. And they started saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And he even said, the one I'm going to dip sop with, that's the one who it is. The amazing thing about all that is the one that he answered the question and said, who I dipped sop with, didn't ask, is it I? 
He's over there just loving on the Lord, leaning on his breast. And Peter looks at him and says, John, ask him who it is. And John said, Lord, who is it? John didn't say, Lord, is it I? John was the closest one. Matter of fact, John's called throughout the book of John the disciple whom Jesus loved. I don't think there was ever a time when Jesus, you know, needed something. He looked around and he said, John, where are you? John's right there next to him all the time. And you'll find every time that Jesus takes any of the disciples with him, and sometimes he only took three, John was always there. Our desire ought to be, be so close to the Lord, he never has to ask where we are. We're right there beside him. I wonder, where are we today? The Lord is asking the question, where art thou? How will you respond to what he says? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. The Lord spoke to your heart. The altar's open. If you're here today and you're not saved, we'd love to introduce you to Christ. He's willing to save you. Are you willing to be saved? They're picking out songs. Some are praying. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the scriptures where they testify of you. We find your greatness and that you're willing to come to fallen man and restore a relationship with him that had been broken by sin. Lord, if there's somebody here today still in their sins, I pray you'd reveal it to them. And Lord, help them to be redeemed, born again. I pray for your children. Lord, you'd speak to their hearts. Those that are next to you, you'd confirm in their hearts they're in right standing. Those that may have strayed a little, I pray you'd convict them and help them to get in right standing. God, bless now. Help this message, Lord, to work its way out through our life and be seen amongst many that will come to trust in Christ. Bless now. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.